Our prayers are with the victims, their families, and the first responders in San Bernardino. Thoughts and prayers are with hashtag San Bernardino. My thoughts and prayers are with the victims, families, and brave first responders. Please keep the victims of hashtag San Bernardino, California in your prayers. Perhaps channeling mine and maybe your anger, impatience, horror, and disgust with the empty platitudes of politicians who are not only on the payroll of the National Rifle Association, but who, with their words, effectively render impotent for most Americans the hope that we seek as people of faith when we look to the God for peace, to God for peace in the carnage and violence of our country. The front page of the Daily News on Thursday read, God isn't fixing this. This week, our country, almost numb with the statistic of more than one mass shooting per day now in 2015, seems to be making maybe a little bit of progress towards sanity. Yesterday, for the first time since 1920, the New York Times editorial board printed a column on the front page above the fold reading, it is a moral outrage and a national disgrace that civilians can legally purchase weapons designed specifically to kill people with brutal speed and efficiency. You know, an editorial on the front page of the New York Times might be an indication that something's changing. But even as someone who uses words for a living, I want to say to everyone opining on the matter, even the New York Times editorial board, do not give me your thoughts and prayers anymore. I'm sick of them. And when I hear people expressing thoughts and prayers, I wonder sometimes, can anything ever change at all? The words of the prophet Jeremiah echoing in my mind, they have treated the wound of my people carelessly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of peace, we are still waiting in the dark and how deep the darkness is today. We're waiting for hope to be born. We're looking for light in the darkness. We're longing for peace in our violenced, ravaged country and in our own hurting lives. And ironically, On this Sunday, the Sunday of peace, the lectionary offers us a little passage from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians at Philippi in which he extends to them, you guessed it, his thoughts and prayers. I am constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for you. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. Paul had a long and affectionate relationship with the church at Philippi as he did with the Thessalonian church we discussed last week. So maybe Paul sat in the darkness of a prison cell and filled with discouragement as it threatened to overwhelm him, he sat down to write a letter. You might recall that Paul went to Philippi initially for the express purpose of preaching in the synagogue and founding a new community of the way. His choice of the city of Philippi was strategic. It was a leading city and a first stop on the famous and well-traveled Via Ignatia. Paul probably arrived at the city of Philippi on his second missionary journey, but he didn't find a synagogue there. Instead, and we should find this interesting, he found himself down by the riverside where he encountered a group of women praying, and one of them was named Lydia. She was a successful dealer in purple cloth, and she opened her house to Paul and his associate Silas. They worked from that place to build a little community in Philippi until until they crossed the political powers that be in that town and ended up in jail there. So think back 
to maybe a long forgotten Sunday school lesson and you might recall that it was in the Philip jail that Paul and Silas kept their spirits up by singing and praying until an earthquake shook the gates of their prison cell open. And though they managed to break out of jail, Paul and Silas knew that their message was too onerous for the authorities in Philippi. And anyway, the little church that they'd started there was growing and thriving with health and enthusiasm. So they went along their way to continue their work across Asia Minor. But it seemed like controversy followed Paul wherever he went. He insisted on preaching this gospel that was an affront to both Jews and Gentiles, particularly to those who held political power. And so he ended up in jail again. And it was from this prison cell that scholars think Paul wrote to his friends in Philippi, sending his thoughts and prayers. I wonder if the church at Philippi, receiving this letter from Paul with an awareness that he was in jail again, their own livelihoods and even lives in danger, and this gospel they had banked their lives on, not really seeming to be changing much of anything, I wonder if they cracked open that wax seal and unrolled the scroll and read Paul's opening words that we heard this morning and started to think to themselves, I am so sick of his thoughts and prayers. We're a community under siege. Paul himself is writing us from jail. What good to us are thoughts and prayers when all we see around us is violence and death and when all we long for, all we long for is peace. You'll notice, however, that unlike many of our leaders who seem content to tweet benign messages that basically translate to no meaningful action whatsoever, the Apostle Paul is not content to stop with thoughts and prayers before he even gets into the meat of his letter right here in this introductory passage he lays out straight that all of this love and all of these thoughts and all of these prayers better well be creating a community in which tenacious commitment to the transformation of the world would overflow he says you must become people from whom a harvest of righteousness will come. Will come out and go beyond your community and impact the world around you in meaningful ways. Paul, I think, is the perfect person to address the despair of well-meaning people of faith maybe our own despair, because he's writing from a prison cell in which he's sitting because a powerful political machine determined to stop the message of radical love insists that he stop. Even from prison, Paul is unwilling to stop at thoughts and prayers, and he has taken action that challenged the status quo, demanding something different, and he's calling the people to do that too. He was writing to the people at Philippi to say he expected the same from them. And why wouldn't he? Moving beyond thoughts and prayers to changing the world is what Jesus did. And having his own life changed by the radical message of love and watching communities transformed by the power of Jesus' gospel, Paul insists that we must keep going. We must keep going. Even when all we see around us is gathering darkness. Why? Because we are Advent people who will wait and hope and work until peace is born in us and in our world. This week it came to my attention that today, December 6th, 2015, is exactly 150 years since the official ratification of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. You'll remember that that amendment reads, 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within these United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. We commonly laud other anniversaries ending slavery in the U.S., but all of them are only part of a larger narrative that led finally to this day 150 years ago. The push among people of faith and conviction for an end to slavery began in the early part of the 19th century. And by the 1950s, a young senator from Illinois was making impassioned speeches denouncing the moral legitimacy of the institution of slavery. By the time Lincoln became president, the country was in social and political turmoil, resulting in 11 states seceding from the Union and forming their own country. In an attempt to get them back in line, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which some of us don't realize only abolished slavery in the Confederate states, not the Union states. At conflict within him, Lincoln felt the pressure of trying to hold a fraying country together and moving decisively to end the enslavement of black Americans. But after his reelection in 1864, Lincoln was finally fed up. He was fed up with the glacial progress of change and fired with the conviction that if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. And he threw his support behind the 13th Amendment, which finally passed through both houses of Congress on January 31st, 1865. President Lincoln then signed a joint resolution submitting the proposed 13th Amendment to the states. January 31st, 1865, it was a great day too, but don't forget, an amendment to the Constitution needs the ratification of three-fourths of the states in the Union. Lincoln and so many others worked tirelessly to get those signatures so that slavery would officially and finally be ended by the Constitution. But predictably, there arose from many corners objections to the amendment. Why would we add an amendment to the Constitution? That would be an affront to the Founding Fathers. Arguments like that. Still, on December 6, 1865, enough signatures were secured and the 13th Amendment was finally added to the Constitution. Years and years and years of work from so many brought the country to that day, but Abraham Lincoln, the president who worked tirelessly and at great personal risk, never saw it happen. He was assassinated almost eight months before that day. Espousing a radical, unpopular message of love and justice and peace is going to take more than thoughts and prayers. Sometimes it will even take our lives. Thank you so much for your thoughts and prayers, but God isn't fixing this. It's up to us to act with courage as people of faith to change this mess we've created. St. Teresa of Avila wrote, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Christ has no body but yours. With that in mind, I think this Sunday it's only right to cling to more than Paul's thoughts and prayers and hang on to the stern direction he gave to the beleaguered church at Corinth. So we do not lose heart because we look not at what can be seen, but what it cannot be seen for what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Will there be peace on earth? Can there be peace on earth? I don't know yet. Because you and I are even now writing the answer to that question. 
If God's reign of peace will ever come to be on this earth, we've got to do more than offer just our thoughts and prayers. God's reign of peace will come to be when the Prince of Peace is born in us. Amen.